This is a continuation of a, of really a series with Jason Holland and myself teaching people how to uh, bass fish. All of these recordings get put on our YouTube page, the TWRA YouTube page, and I think Jason puts them out as well on Jason Holland Fishing. Uh, yes, sir. Jason uh, is one, a good friend of mine. Two, he's one of the better bass fishermen that um, that I've, I've ever seen, especially when it comes to grass. And that begins next month, and we'll have another um, show over grass fishing and do that uh, next month as well. So, but today we're going to talk ledge fishing. And uh, ledge fishing begins uh, as soon as as the spawn is over in April and May. Uh, this year the spawn was a little bit delayed and uh, these fish didn't get out to the ledges as soon as they normally do. But um, we'll talk about ledge fishing tonight. Uh, Jason, uh, you've got Jason Holland Fishing on. Uh, go ahead and give, give people where they can find you. Yeah, absolutely. You can check me out on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, we're just now kind of getting that YouTube channel up and going, getting it built. So we have uh, some of these videos out there. Uh, and that's really what we're working toward right now to, to build that channel up. Uh, TikTok and all the different social medias. But it's Jason Holland Fishing. Search me and uh, you should see my ugly mug pop up. That's right. So when we talk about ledge fishing, what we're really referring to is uh, a time of the year when bass leave the shallows. Uh, and when we say leave the shallows, we're not saying every bass in the system is going to leave shallow water and go out to these ledges. That's just not the case, especially on Old Hickory. Old Hickory Lake is a shallow water fishery. You can catch them shallow all year long. Um, but the greatest majority of fish in the system are going to travel out to what we call ledges. And uh, ledges can be some of the greatest fishing uh, on earth when you hit it right. It can be absolutely terrible if you don't. Um, and just like a lot of other fishing, it takes time to learn. And um, you've kind of just got to stick with it until, until you hit it. Uh, and, and you will, you'll hit it and you'll say, oh my gosh, what, what, ha how could I have missed this for so long? So uh, to find good ledges, you've got to be able to read a topographic map. And when I refer to a ledge, all I'm talking about is you can, it can either be a creek channel ledge or it can be a river channel ledge. And, and what that is, is where the uh, creek channel or the main river channel jumps up uh, to what used to be dry land before the impoundment was flooded. So what that looks like, Jason, I'm going to share a screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, while you're doing that, I'll add a couple things to it. So uh, when I first got into fishing, uh, like a lot of other people, I started fishing shallow. Yeah, Mike, we can see it's popped up there. And as I got more into fishing and of course the uh, got electronics, I started understanding what fish do, the patterns that they run. Uh, I had a real mental block uh, to try to figure out uh, what that means. What does that look like? Uh, what is it? And so in my mind, the way that I uh, eventually got my head wrapped around it was a couple of things. One, and Mike just pointed to it, is a creek ledge. So if you think about uh, Old Hickory, for example, we talk about, so they, they dammed it up. And again, a lot of these areas were dry ground that may have had a creek running through it. And so when they flooded it out, that creek, that the indention that creek had made was still there. So now the water just came up and now you have this kind of a, uh, a road necessarily is a good way to think about it, or just kind of a, a cutout or a ditch or uh, where the creek used to be. And so when you think about a creek ledge, just imagine that that was a, at one time dry land. Now it's water uh, over top of it. And you're going to fish what used to be the old shoreline of that creek. And you're going to, and then from there, so let's just say uh, before that creek was there, uh, you're standing in the middle of the creek. You're going to cast toward the bank in that creek and you're going to bring your bait out. This is how, again, how I might my mind around it. 
So it's, so you're, you're wading the creek, you're throwing toward the bank, and you're bringing your bait out. You're doing the exact same thing now. You're just doing it in much deeper water from a boat. You're still going to throw to that, that creek uh, bank, even though now, then it may have been one foot. Now it could be eight or nine feet. And you're going to bring it back to you, and that's going to go from eight or nine feet right, up. It could be five feet, whatever the case may be. And it could fall off to 20 or 25 feet. So it's the same thing. Just it's just you have now you have more water and more depth to work with. And that's how I got my mind wrapped around what a creek ledge was. A river ledge is in essence the same thing, but just imagine that uh, they had to come through here and they had to dig out this really deep channel, as you see Mike showing us here in the white. They had to come in and make that deeper just so that they could get barges up and down. They had to dredge it. And what that did, so just imagine if you're in your backyard and uh, you have a backhoe and you dig a ditch. You're going to have, of course, the ground that's flat and then it's going to drift off into the uh, trench or into that ditch you just dug with the backhoe. Same concept, just you're dealing it with water and you're dealing it with, with deeper water. But just imagine that ditch that you dug with the backhoe, how it's deeper in the bottom and it comes up on the side and then it kind of rounds up at the top. Very close parallel to what a river ledge is. And we say ledge, we're talking about here's the bottom of your ditch, here's where you dug it up, and then here's the top part of the land. We're talking about this the little area from the shallow to the deep. So hopefully that it's a very uh, generic analogy, but hopefully that at least gives you some ideas of what that looks like or what we're talking about when we say a ledge. When we say top of the ledge, we're talking about uh, in our ditch analogy, the ground before you start digging your ditch. And we talk about when it, when it drops off is when it goes from the ground, it starts headed back down. That's exactly what we're referring to. Yeah. I, I think of like you, when I started fishing ledges, what I thought about was a pool. I think for a lot of people, they can see that in their mind. It's not, it's not the shallow end and it's not the deep end. It's that little part that slopes down from shallow to deep. That's the ledge. That's where the break is. And so some people call it a break. Some people call it a ledge. But they're both the same thing. And on this main river channel, this is the main river channel, right? The ledge on this would be this break. This break right here. Okay, so those fish... Uh, when they're very, very active, they'll be up on top of this, this ledge. When they're somewhat active, they'll be falling off this ledge. When they're inactive, they suspend out over this ledge. And so we'll talk about all that, but um, that's what a ledge is. Think of a pool, think of a ditch like uh, Jason's talking about, and you can have a ledge in a creek channel, or you can have a main river ledge. And uh, that's, that's how you're, you're gonna find them. You need to start reading your uh, topographic maps. And so how do you read this topographic map? Well, this is a Navionics map. Uh, Humminbird has their own maps. And when you're, truthfully, I've, I've run uh, Lawrence units, I have two uh, 12s that I run and they run these Navionics chips. Navionics is good, but I can tell you what, there's nothing like those Humminbird uh, maps that I, I went out and bought a standalone mapping uh, Humminbird unit just for the, the mapping on it. So um, mapping from Humminbird, it, it's, just, it's just night and day when it comes to this, but Navionics is good too. And so if I were going to try and find a creek ledge, um, say I was like, this is Old Hickory Lake, okay? This over here is Spencer Creek. What you're trying to find are turns in the river or creek ledge. All of this is a ledge, okay? That doesn't mean it's all good. It doesn't mean it's all bad either, but you have to spend the time to find the good stuff. And the good stuff normally occurs, normally, 
when there's a turn in the creek channel or a turn in the main river channel or some creek intersects with that channel uh, at some point. In Spencer Creek, what you're looking for are turns. So this is a creek channel bend right here. And so, matter of fact, you see the shallow water here? That's the shallow ledge. This is the break. Those fish will either be right up here or they're gonna fall off this break. And they'll be somewhere around this, this point. They could be anywhere on it. And, and that's, the, that's another thing you have to remember. Um, you, this is not a situation where you find a spot on your map at home like this, and then you go in, go to the lake with the game plan of, well, I'm going to go here uh, to this spot, spot one, uh, and I'm going to fish there for an hour. I'm going to go to spot two. I'm going to fish there for an hour. I'm going to go to spot three, and I'm going to fish there for an hour. That is not how this works. Uh, if you do that, you will wind up wasting a lot of time. Uh, what you do, and this is this is going to be totally different than you've ever fished, more than likely in your life. You do not pick up a rod until you run over this ledge, going back and forth in a zigzag pattern. Um, Jason, do you do still do zigzags with side imaging, or do you have you changed? No, I mean you can't. The, the zigzag piece is still uh, fundamentally what you want to do, even with side scan. Um, you, you can go out, they say, Hey, it can go out. I think it's up to, uh, don't quote me on this, but I want to say it's like 300 feet, basically 150 on each side, but it, no, you really can't, yeah, you can't go that far. Uh, you got to bring it in to really see it. And so really the zigzag, um, what I will do is I, and Mike picked a perfect example and I love the spot. Uh, I actually caught one of the biggest fish I've ever caught on old hickory exactly on the spot that Mike is showing. Yeah. Ian Hughes so, going to for this. Yeah, well, he'll have to just get over it because it's, uh, it's becoming very popular. But uh, in this scenario, what I will do is I will run that uh, area and just do a straight line with side scan to see if I can pick up uh, anything, uh, anything that stands out. And then from there, uh, I will drop into a down scan and do more of a, a zigzag pattern. But, uh, Mike, I do want to point out one thing real quick uh, that I don't want to take for granted that uh, individuals on the call may or may not know. When you're looking at a topographical map, the tighter the lines are together, in this case, you'll see you'll, the lines are in black, and so you'll have some darker shading. Mike, you zoom out just a hair for me. Uh, I'll try. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, if, you zoom, if we zoom out just a little bit, you can actually, and Mike will say, all right, that's perfect. You can see these darker lines, and you actually can see exactly where that creek channel is. And so the tighter the lines, a topographical map, uh, mean that it's a steeper drop. And so uh, from there, you're able to really determine exactly where that, if you were just looking at a map, uh, a topographical map, you're going to be able to clearly see uh, the channel or that cut out creek uh, channel through uh, this area. And so I, I just want to, I want to put that in there real quick to make sure not we weren't taking that for granted, but that's, that's how you look at it. You'll actually uh, as Mike's doing, you will very easily indicated exactly where that creek channel is. And as you see, the, mic, the, the area Mike is showing is a perfect example. You see how it kind of comes down and then makes this uh, uh, little turn to the right, now, this little bend, uh, horse, half horseshoe. Uh, there's a lot of different names for it, um, but that's exactly where you're looking for. Again, you can do a lot of studying on your maps at home, and to Mike's point, no, you can't go and just go fish at this exact spot for an hour. But what I think will help you is if you can then know if you're looking at Spencer Creek, you will know exactly at least some good ideas where to start based on some of the things that we're talking about. And if you're looking at this, that is a great place to start because of that bend. Uh, and again, you think about it, all we're doing, if you will follow these courses, uh, all we're doing is following this fish out. So, again, we've talked about the, the pre-spawn as they're moving back into that creek. Very back in the creek, we talked about the spawn. Now they're moving out to the areas that they're going to spend uh, the summertime. And, again, they're using these highways or these roads, which are the creek channels. And then from there, 
they're staging up for where they're going to spend the winter time. And this is a perfect example. Uh, if you think about that bend, the, the current is going to come in, it's going to hit that bend and it's going to make that turn, which is going to compress uh, and cause more current to be there. And all that that does is compresses the bait in that area. And ultimately that's why the fish are there. And that's the other point I want to make sure we understand, Hey, here's where you're looking, but why you're looking there is because that is where all the bait fish are going to gang up. It's going to be the area that the current is hitting harder because of that bend and everything gets compressed and stacks up. And that's why the bass are going to be sitting there and they're going to be out there feeding. That's right. So you can look at this Creek channel in Spencer and you can see that there's really, the fish can roam anywhere they want to right through here, right? There's nothing really holding them down, down there. And, the difference in this ledge uh, versus the deep here is four feet. This is 24 feet versus 28 feet. They can roam anywhere they want here until they get here. And it's a chute. This is like a tunnel in a mountain. I mean, that's the way I look at it. All the fish in this system, they're not going to jump all the way up here. That's 15 foot of difference between the bottom of this creek channel and the top of this. So it's, it's going to funnel all the fish down to right here. Just like when I think of this, I also think of, of deer hunting. Where, where is going to put you intersecting with the most fish? This is a funnel. And so it's going to shove the fish through this, through this gap. And when they come through this gap, making their way out to the river channel, they're going to stop on this ledge. Okay, they're going to stop here. And then the next spot I would say that I would fish is here. This is a hump. It's 13 feet on top. And truthfully, it's, it's a little, it's, it's shallower than that in real life. Uh, Navionics got that a little off, but it's about eight feet on top of that hump. So that's, that's the next good place that you want to check. And you're just looking for places that where, where deep water intersects shallow water in a very abrupt way. So this is six feet. This is about as abrupt as it gets in Spencer Creek. This is an abrupt change in, in depth. Um, this, not so much, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a huge change there. Um, this, eh, I mean, it looks all right, but it's not a huge change. If you pull on out, this is a pretty big change, okay? 30 to 14 feet up on top, 30 to 14 feet on top. Those are creek ledges, okay? That's what a creek ledge looks like. And you just, like I said, you're looking for change big change not this okay i'm not saying that fish won't be on there at some point in time they probably will but it won't congregate the fish like something like that right there would right jason yeah you're 100 right and one thing i do want to uh and as you were talking it, it kind of came to me that i probably need to take just a second and explain uh the reason why the fish are doing what they're doing in the summertime why do they go out here? Why are they going out to these creek channels? There's a couple of reasons why. One, uh, as you know, I'm in Nashville, and uh, as we all know, we're going through this massive heat wave right now. Water temps gets really hot. When that does, the water does not oxygenate as well. And so as these fish will then, they will regulate their temperature based on where they're at in the water, co water column. So they will drop down lower where the water is cooler, it's more oxygenated, and it's more comfortable to them. The other reason is, is that all, of, I say all, a good portion of the bait fish, in our case, the shad, will move out in big bait balls and they will suspend over these areas as well because they want the same thing. They want cooler water, more oxygenized water. And so, again, fishing is, as Mike just said earlier, is very much like hunting. You're following the food source and it's exactly what these bass are doing. They want to stay cool. They want to stay in the most oxygenated waters they possibly can and very close to a food source. And in a system this time of year, these offshore areas, these deep drops and these humps and these ledges, 
That is where the bait will go. That is where the bass will follow. And the bait goes there for all the reasons we just talked about. So that's the reason why, And because you think, well, if the bass is shallow, then why would he stay shallow all year? And to Mike's point at the very beginning, that doesn't mean every single fish on Oat Hickory is out here on these ledges. Does it? You can catch shallow fish year round. You can catch deep fish year round. But the larger percentage, what you're trying to do is find the largest percentage of the fish in the lake. And that is where you're, all you're trying to do is just maximize your effort, maximize the benefits. And this is the part uh, of the lake and the system. These time, this time of year is where the bass are going to want to go. That's right. Now, so that's a creek channel ledge, right? So what does a river channel ledge? Well, the easiest river channel ledges to find are super easy, and they're what um, people refer to as community holes. And Jason will show you some on Kentucky Lake here in a bit. I'll show you uh, community holes on, uh, on Old Hickory. Uh, the easiest ledges on a river channel to find are where major creeks intersect the river channel. And believe it or not, these are some, especially when you get to Kentucky Lake, are some of the best ledges on the entire lake. The problem with them is, one, they get beat to death beginning May 15th all the way through July. Right, Jason? Yeah, I mean, it, everybody that knows is doing the exact same thing, guys, that we're talking about here. They're, everybody's trying to get to the largest population of fish. And so uh, everybody that is into fishing and really pays attention to it, this is where they're going to start to migrate. And that's why, if you look, springtime, you don't see a bunch of boats sitting out in the middle of the lake, bass boats. This time of year, look at Old Hickory, you'll see a lot more bass boats out in the middle of the lake. And that's the reason, because they're fishing these ledges. That's right. So... If you're out on Kentucky Lake or you are on Old Hickory, uh, if you want, if you've looked at a ledge and it's a creek ledge and it's entering into the main river, uh, and you want to fish it and you want to go and get there, and and be the one that's fishing that, you better get there, uh, especially on Kentucky Lake because you're going to be there with about, I don't know, I've seen five six boats fishing the same ledge especially Leatherwood or, or something like that. But this is a main river ledge. This is a main river ledge. This is a main river ledge. Those are very easy ledges to find, okay? And on Old Hickory, these type of ledges, um, you know, this one is the Spencer ledge. It's not, it's not one of the better ledges on, on Old Hickory, but uh, Old Hickory and Kentucky Lake are different lakes. When you see this on Kentucky Lake, you better believe that's one of the better ledges. And and there'll be five, six, seven boats on that one ledge, just moving up and down the break, like like we talked about earlier, and throwing up and bringing it off the break. They'll throw up and bring it off the break, just like that. Now, so that's the Spencer ledge. Here's Station Camp ledge. In between Spencer and Cage's Bend, which is down here, there are a great number of ledges, and these ledges are very good. This is a ledge, here's a ledge, and there are a bunch of little turns right through here that have ledges on them. Now, Navionics is not showing it on here, but there are turns in this river channel. When you get onto your mapping software in your in your graph this shows up a little better but this is a ledge this is an old old creek channel that came out uh before the water was impounded and uh this is the creek channel coming out into the main river and this is a ledge and so that's one of on old hickory some of the better ledges are these hidden hidden ledges not main creeks that enter into the river it's these hidden ones that are the better ledges on old hickory i don't know why that is but it is the case As a matter of fact this one right here uh, is normally uh, or was a muscle bed it, you know there's shell bed on that ledge and then after that there are ledges down here you see how this creek enters into the water or into the river right here that's a ledge right here, okay? 
So what you're looking for are turns in the river channel. This is Cedar Creek's ledge, and it's actually a pretty good ledge. Uh, throw up on top and bring it off. Uh, sometimes those fish on this ledge will station up here where it gets real shallow and you'll bring it off that ledge. The, the thing about fishing these ledges, like I said, you're just not going to go out and say, well, Mike told me that these four spots I need to fish and, and that's where they'll be. That's not the case. You need to get in your boat, drive over each of these spots, and look for fish. And if you don't see fish, it's pointless to even stop and throw a cast. Uh, you will see them if they're there. Uh, I'll show you a couple more places that I would check on Old Hickory. Um, and then I'll show, we'll go into, you wanna do Kentucky Lake next, Jason? And yeah, then we'll absolutely. What they, what they actually look like on the, on the, on the graph. All right. so. This is down river on Old Hickory. This is Drake's Creek, okay? Uh, bluegrass is right here. Um, and what your, is that bluegrass? No. Bluegrass is right here, okay? From here, from bluegrass down on this lake, it is full of ledges, all right? And what you have to do is you have to zoom in and look for the greatest amount of change in the least amount of uh, span of water. Okay, so this is the bluegrass ledge. This is a pretty good ledge right here. And actually out in front of bluegrass, it is full of ledges. Here's another one. Matter of fact, I know one of the major tournaments on this lake was was one off these ledges, right out in front of bluegrass. Here's another one, eight feet on top, 60 feet. This is a 20 foot ledge, think of a cliff. This ledge is like a tabletop and it falls off uh, into, the, into the river. So it's just a cliff. Like I said, this is the shallow end of the pool, the deep end of the pool, this is the ledge. And what you're trying to do is take your bait and run it on that shallow part. And when it comes off that table, that's when it's gonna get grabbed. So that's a ledge. Here's a ledge. You look for the top of the table, right? This is the cut. This is the old creek channel entering into the river. You see how the topo lines are high spotted right here and here. This is the low spot. This is a saddle, okay? Think of a, a saddle. So it falls off here, comes back up on the other side, right? Here's another ledge. Here's another ledge. Yeah. It is full of ledges out in front yeah. of uh, bluegrass. Go ahead. I'll, I'll add one thing to that. And so, uh, and again, I can always talk about me and not get in trouble. When I first started, I, I would look at this and I would – way 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 overwhelmed i would look at this creek channel and be like or the river channel like well guys i mean the whole thing's a ledge right the whole thing's 50 something feet at the bottom it comes up to you know whatever on top 8 10 12 feet well the the whole river channel is a ledge and it, it just fundamentally that's true. true but what you're doing is you're looking for the highest percentage of spots and mike is very it, it mike's being right because it's when you're using this tool that we're using, because it has so much information, it does not give you some of the subtle details. And we're gonna actually show some of that here in a minute. But what you're looking for right now, when you look at this, you just see a black line on the left-hand side of that ledge. As, you, as we scroll in and get tighter uh, to the picture, you see a little bit of indication, but not necessarily a lot. What you're looking for is that this river ledge, though it may look straight, is not. It's got twists and turns and it's got little points and subtle changes. And what you're doing is two things. One, you're looking for those transition spots outside of big spawning flats. Uh, this one, what Mike is showing is a perfect example. Outside of bluegrass, they're moving again out to the riverside where they're going to spend the summer. 
And so you can look and say, okay, all these fish are coming to that area, all these big flatter areas of the lake. The second thing, even though you can't necessarily see them very well in this demonstration, you're going to, you're going to, all these little ledges have nooks and crannies, and it's a very good indication of where to look. The other third thing you're looking for is, as we talked about, you're looking for bends or turns in the channel. The other thing you got to remember is um, these systems are going to be dictated by current flow. And we're not going to get way too deep in the weeds of current flow because, again, we're going to try to keep it in a short time frame and not give you too much information. But the higher the current flow, meaning the more the current is banging into it, the more important it is going to be to look for those little nuances, those little turns, little cuts in that river channel that breaks the water, excuse me, that breaks the current as it comes down. We're going to leave it, leave it there, leave it hovering, and you can, we can you know, pick that up at a later time. But current flow on these TVA lakes is extremely, extremely important to maximize the ledge river, the river ledge bite. So if you're looking at a topo map, like Jason was saying, the easiest way to narrow down your search is to, if you, if you really want to know, look at this right side of the river channel versus the left side of the river channel. This right side is pretty straight. There's really not an abrupt change. You see, the biggest change goes from 12 to 7 feet. That's a 5-foot ledge, and it's really not, there's really not anything to turn it. This is 14 to 8 feet of water. That's, that's not an abrupt enough change. I mean, I'm not saying there's not fish there, but I, I'm not going to stop and hope that the greatest number of fish in this system are going to stop on that ledge. If you come over here and look, you take your cursor and come down and find the biggest change. 24 feet, 8 feet. You come down. This is not a big change right here. You come here, 9 feet, 25 feet. 9 feet, 25 feet, right? Not a big change here. Nine feet, 25 feet. You, you're looking for these abrupt changes, and that's all you're looking for. So those are hidden, what I would call, the, you know, to a lot of people, those are hidden ledges on this lake. They're not the easy ones that you're going to find by just reviewing a, a topo. That is going to come to you by really – pretty good in-depth map study. Um, whereas these ledges, like this one, that's a pretty easy ledge to find, right? You can see the creek channel entering into the water. You can see the creek channel here entering into the water. One of the best ledges on this entire lake is the easiest ledge on the entire lake to find. This is the Drake's Creek ledge. Best best ledge on the entire lake. Uh, we did a, uh, a video last year uh, that is on the TWRA YouTube channel on ledge fishing uh, with a guide uh, who is Jason and my great friend, Ian Huey. If you really, really want to learn how to ledge fish, get in the boat with Ian Huey. Uh, both sides of this creek channel entering into the main river channel are ledges, 15 to 40 feet right? Abrupt change, 15 to 40 feet. This is 10 and 12 feet of water, 26 feet of water. You're looking for the abrupt change. This, not a huge abrupt change. You can see how the topo lines are more spread out. That's not what you're looking for. You're looking for this abrupt change, and it's the biggest abrupt change in the water relative to anywhere else around, okay? So this over here is an abrupt change, you see? So that is what uh, ledges look like on, on Old Hickory. Here's Drake's Creek Ledge entering into the main river channel. Those are, that's an easy ledge to find. These ledges right down here are easy ledges to find. You just follow the creek channel into the main body of water, okay? But what is not easy to find are what a lot of people that are, are you know, just weekend anglers are not going to find and not going to spend the time doing 
are all these ledges. A abrupt change, 12 feet to 50 feet, 10 feet to 50 feet, 11 feet to 50 feet. Those are humps and ledges on the main body out in Old Hickory. And they're some of the better ledges on this lake. Most of these big creek ledges, most of them on Old Hickory are not the best ledges on this lake. Uh, but that's how you find them. That's what they look like uh, on Old Hickory and they'll, they'll look the same way on Kentucky Lake. Jason, you wanna take Kentucky Lake? Uh, I do. Let me. Uh, we had a question pop up real quick, and I will hit it. Uh, the question was um, from Jessica: is Center Hill or Cordell Hull, a good lake to ledge fish or fish the ledges. And so I figured we'd hit that real fast, and then we can jump to Kentucky Lake. Well, there are ledges. I grew up on Center Hill. Um, I did not. I don't. I really have never fished uh, Cordell Hull except a couple of times. That lake stays cool. There are ledges on Cordell, and there are ledges on um, Center Hill. Now, uh, Center Hill is going to play totally different than it has the last 20 years because they brought it up about 20 feet, and so it's killed all the ledges that a lot of people used to fish uh, out in front of um, Hurricane Marina. Uh, and and the swimming area on Hurricane used to be one of the best ledges on that lake. Now it's under 40 feet of water. It used to be a 20 foot ledge all the way around that, and that's why they um, put the the buoy markers out there to keep people from running aground. That's because the river jumped up onto a table. So um, Center Hill and and those highland reservoirs like Dale Hollow, I'm not saying they don't have ledges because uh, Dale Hollow has the Kemper Flats. It's a huge ledge, uh, one of the better places to fish on that entire lake. But those lakes are highland reservoirs. They don't set up like Old Hickory, uh, Kentucky Lake, Pickwick, Chickamauga, Nickajack, Watts Bar. Those lakes, uh, at Cordell Hole too, are what you think of when you think ledge fishing. So you want a riverine system, one that's a big river run system um, to set these ledges up. And uh, that's what you're looking for. Highland reservoirs, what you're looking for is big points that create tables, just like a ledge, but big points sticking out into the main river channel that create their own table up on top. And then they fall off into deep water and they set up the same way as a ledge would in a river system. Jason? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was gonna hit on. Uh, they don't have ledges per se, kind of what we're talking about. Again, we're really focusing on kind of that TVA uh, overall system of lakes, but uh, Mike hit, hit, I mean, hit it perfectly. You're looking for those tabletops or those long uh, points that come out into, uh, into the actual river itself. Uh, and find those nooks and crannies or big boulders on top of those. Um, you know, it's it's the same but different. I guess we could put it that way. Yeah. Think main river channel on Center Hill. I'm not saying uh, Center Hill's creeks are enormous. I mean, they, fish stay there all year long. But if I'm going to go out on Center Hill in the summer and I'm going to find the greatest congregation of the greatest number of fish, I'm going to look for huge tabletop points sticking out into the middle of the river channel. So uh, that's where I'm going. Um, all right, Jason, you wanna share your screen and go on to Kentucky Lake? Yes, I do. Share screen. So bear with me, it's my first time to do share screen, so we'll see how we do. Oh, you got it. Hey, looky there. All right, so what we're looking at here is um, quite possibly the greatest uh, ledge fishing lake in the entire country. Uh, it's what Kentucky Lake is known for is ledge fishing. People come from all over the country and ultimately all over the world to come fish the ledges on Kentucky Lake. Uh, and we're gonna talk about some of those. So we're going to uh, figure out how to minimize you here. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit. We're gonna hit some of the, the more prominent ones uh, and just kind of and that's is correlate with exactly what Mike said. Just so you know, on the right side, we're over here. This is Leatherwood, that yellow line across the top. That is 
uh, the bridge going across. Uh oh, what am I doing here? That's the bridge going across Paris Landing. And uh, just to kind of give you guys some orientation of where we're at. Uh, so we'll talk real quick on the creek, creek ledges that we talked about. Uh, this is the ledge going into Leatherwood, as we talked about. Uh, you know, here is that something very obvious down here. This is the creek channel coming out into the main river channel, fishing both sides of this and also both sides of these uh, points or arrowheads. I just a lot of names for them, but I call them points. But uh, arrowhead is a, a pretty good indication as well. You're going to fish both sides of these. Uh, and not only both sides of the points, you're gonna, of the arrowhead, you're going to fish both sides of the creek, creek mouth coming out. Uh, from there, uh, there's some additional, uh, get over here, there's some additional opportunities uh, within this. And this is called the horseshoe. Uh, there is a, uh, a lot of tournaments that are won in this specific area. If you look, this is a big creek uh, coming into another creek. This is the creek channel, excuse me. Right here, you got this, uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're standing right in the Leatherwood, excuse me. This is the, the horseshoe um, that in Standing Rock that everybody refers to. There's a lot of tournaments that uh, are won and are catch a lot of their keepers off this specific spot. Again, we're talking about that abrupt change. We're talking about that specific drop. Uh, and this is a huge one, and I'm gonna zoom out. You'll see how big Standing Rock is. I mean, this is a massive creek. And the best drop or the best change, as Mike's been talking about, you've got this tabletop or you've got this little, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, Mike? What's the word I'm looking for? Hump. Anyway, hump. There's the word. You've got this hump in the middle of the creek, and then you got the drop off dropping up here to 31 or so feet. Uh, can't really see it on here, but this is actually about five or six feet. So uh, that is really good uh, in Standing Rock. And we're going to go down. Uh, we're headed to an area that's uh, kind of a um, community hole, but we're going to talk about it now. Uh, something that's a little bit different with Kentucky Lake uh, compared to an old hickory is that there is a lot of secondary points, a lot of secondary channels that, um, again, a lot of these areas, uh, a lot of folks are going to focus on right here, which is the creek going into the main river channel. And they're also going to focus on a lot of these areas right here that have a lot of different points. But if you will look, because it's such a, it's a much bigger body of water, uh, Kentucky Lake is compared to an old hickory, you have a lot of opportunities on what we call secondary drops, secondary channels, secondary points, um, a lot of different names for them. But basically, instead of being out here on the main river channel or fishing where these creek creeks uh, drop into the main river channel. Here's a prime example of an area that uh, gives you the ability to fish where maybe not everybody else is fishing. And big, big area of water, but you can see exactly, uh oh, hang on. We got this uh, hump right here in the middle of a creek and it drops back out in here. So again, it's not the same depth as we've been out here in the main river channel, but we're, look, we're up here at six dropping off into 2024. And so from a percentage ratio, uh, I mean, you're looking at roughly, what is that, uh, triple, give or take, maybe even quadruple, uh, the depth change from on top of this hump down in here, uh, going back into Short Creek. Here's another area to look at. Uh, you're sitting up here at uh, 11 or so, and you're dropping off here into 17 to 25. These are little areas that you can come and scan uh, and see if there's some opportunities where may not be as big as a group of fish that are sitting on uh, this type of area or in this little uh, off this little hump here compared to out here. But a lot of the times, some of your bigger fish will come in these more isolated areas, uh, and definitely worth taking a look at and seeing what we got, uh, what you got to work with. Uh, so we're going to go in here to Leatherwood, um, and this is probably uh, well. Let me, before we go over there, uh, I'm going to show you one other area that is really, really good that uh, I've spent a lot of time on. And it's a really great transition, kind of what we talked about before, um, but it's this area right here. It's the huge 
course, the big main river channel, and you got this huge uh, open area, and you got this creek running right here. And this creek runs all the way back into, uh, as you can see, let me zoom out just a little bit, all the way down into this area. And the main route to get back onto this, because typically they're going to follow, think about a path through the woods. Uh, even though you can walk through the woods, if there's a, a defined path, nature, you know, just naturally you're going to walk the path. Well, if you look at this right here where my cursor is, this is a natural path that gets all the way back into this entire area up in here. Uh, there is some, uh, also, as you can see on this map, there's some uh, eel grass that actually grows up in this area. So it's a really uh, great area for fish to come and populate. And to get there, oh boy, I keep hitting the wrong button, Mike. I apologize. To get there, this is the main route to get in there. And so this whole area right here is absolutely fantastic uh, all the way through, uh, but mainly in this radius right here uh, to go check out. So we'll, real quick, We've talked about Leatherwood a couple times. Leatherwood, this is the uh, textbook area for ledge fishing. And of course, as we talked about earlier, you'll hit these two uh, arrowheads going into it. But if you look at this, you got this big, I'm gonna zoom out real quick. You got Leatherwood's this big massive creek all right here. And the highway or the road to get in there is just this road right here. And it takes you all the way back. So these fish are going to migrate out of here and they're going to be coming out here to stage for the summertime. And they all get funneled. They all get bottlenecks, whatever term you want to use, right in this area. And so what you do is you'll fish. When you come in here, you'll fish this whole section, focusing on these two areas. Again, they're coming out of this creek, heading out. So you'll fish this, these two areas right here to catch them on the way out. And then you'll make sure you focus on these two areas right here for the fish that have already migrated and made it out there. Now, another spot... Oh, let me get it back over here. Another spot that's really, really good. And this is a prime example of what we talked about earlier at Old Hickory, but it was kind of hard to see on the mapping. This is a, uh, this is a great example of that. Look right here. You kind of got this indention. Uh, we'll call it that. You kind of got this little cut. So in essence, you have another, this is the main creek ledge coming out, but you also have another little area of, uh, of this area that cuts back. And so, again, you'll fish the little point here and you'll fish the point here. Again, it's, it's a subtle change, but it's completely different opposed to this whole area is just straight coming out. And then you got any, any irreg irregularities, this word I'm trying to get out of my mouth right now, is uh, something that you want to focus on and take a look at because uh, it's a great place for those fish to, uh, to stop at or they can, they can congregate right there. What the but, what Jason just showed you, and, and you'll hear you'll hear people when, when you watch ledge fishing on YouTube uh, and they'll talk about ledge fishing and they'll say, well, this is a great ledge. We're fishing this ledge. What Jason just showed you is what they call the spot on the spot. OK, so if you're going to fish Leatherwood, that turn and, and a lot of people call it a turn or a cut in the ledge. That is the spot on the spot. That's where the fish are going to congregate. So there's, if you zoom in, if you zoom in on that, Jason. Sure. Oh, fine. There we go. All right. So if you look at that, there's a table up on 16 feet, and it's really not 16 feet. That is a table. But if you come off the ledge, there's another table. You see that? Yeah, right in there, Jason. You see that mm -hmm. table? Those fish will sit at the base of that ledge right before it drops off again. That is the spot on the spot, the secondary table on that ledge. And uh, if you're going to fish Leatherwood, more than likely, that's where your big fish is going to come from. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you hear it called, uh, spot on the spot is the, the biggest uh, used. Some people call it the juice of an area, uh, you know, the sweet spot, a lot of different names for it. But again, it's just something different in a highly, a high percentage area where bass are going to be. It's another small area. So again, it's, it's just that con that constant drilling down, drilling down to get the absolute best spot of a spot. 
Uh, and that is exactly where that's at. Now, another thing we'll show you real quick, and I know we're getting short on time. It's some of the stuff we want to do. Um, let me scroll down here. We talked about these um, little cutbacks, and these are all areas to check out uh, as you're doing it. But when you're looking for secondary ledges, uh, here is a great, a great one um, that I'll give Mike all my secrets. But uh, this is Hurricane, uh, or if Mike says it's Hurricane, or what part of the country you're from, how do you want to say it? I call it Hurricane. You grew um, up in McMinnville, and, and you're talking <laughs> to Center Hill. It's Hurricane. But if you get <laughs> educated, you move away, and you go to law school or something like that, then it becomes Hurricane. And people then it becomes it. Hurricane. Uh, the, uh, this is Hurricane or Hurricane Creek on Kentucky Lake. And again, we're not going to keep beating the dead horse. Obviously, this is a really high percentage spot. What's really great about this one is this turn back right here. But one of the best spots on this whole area, when the when they're pushing a lot of current, is this area right here. Because the current's going to come here and it's going to get slowed down a little bit, and then it's going to crash right into this turn. And those bass will sit right here in this turn, and it will look like spaghetti on your graph. And we'll talk about what spaghetti looks like or what that means, but one of the best spots. But um, – let me zoom out real quick and show you the secondary ledges uh, of this area. And they are right here. Uh, you got this whole creek channel coming back, but then you got this secondary area right here. Uh, and that's something that's, uh, this one that makes it really unique is the fact, and if you can see it here on the graph, scroll down, it's word right here, roadbed. So that means at one time there was a road that comes in here. So now you have a ledge and you also have a cutout of where a road used to be. And so now you have multiple areas that are attracting bass uh, and attracting more bass in a specific area. And so when you go, again, you're looking for the highest percentage area. And that is right here on this point that kind of comes out. And then right here, as it makes a turn, this road bed, uh, it actually, the road bed's up here off the ledge a little bit, but it is a high percentage spot. And so again, we're looking for areas that have the highest percentage and now you're adding multiple things to an area. You got a channel fling, you got it bumps up to, uh, you know, some deeper water is going out into the creek and you also have a road bed. And also if you look at this thing right here, flooded timber, this is actually is an island, now depending on where the water level is at. Uh, and so now you've got more structure underneath. And so fantastic area to try. And those are high percentage areas that have a lot of different things going on that uh, other than just a normal ledge. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and, and move to what, what do they look like when you find them? Okay. Yep. So like we said, don't pull up to these areas and just start throwing baits, scan them. If you don't see fish down there, it's because there are no fish down there. You will see these fish. You've just got to do a zigzag pattern, do these over top of the ledge, and you're gonna find these fish if they're there. If you don't see them, don't fish, move on. Uh, you will spend a lot of time graphing, uh, but the big deal is when you see them and they're set up right, you're gonna spend a lot of time catching these fish and you might catch a hundred in, in an hour. Uh, you might catch 30 in 20 minutes. Uh, I've done it. Jason's done it. We've Ian Huey does it all the time. So Ian Huey did it this past weekend. Uh, so let me show you a short video on what these fish look like um, when they set up on these ledges and what you want them to look like. So Jason, I'm going to share this screen. Sure. It doesn't work. Yeah, I'll set it up real quick. Uh, the guy that's going to be talking on this, his name is Jason Seelock. He's out of, and where he's at is on Kentucky Lake. So uh, this will give you real world scenario. All right, here we go. So a lot of people look at their graph and they see these marks down here on, you know, and they're like, man, I found an awesome school of bass. Well, no, you found fish on a place, but this lake is, you know, a lake on the TVA system, the, these fish are accustomed to being offshore. When I say fish, I'm talking about every fish in here. Drum school up offshore, Asian carp school up offshore, catfish school up offshore. The bluegill will in the summer. 
I've spent a ton of time going up and down these ledges and people will see this stuff and go, man, look at all the bass. None of those are bass. Those are all Asian carp. What I've learned is when they're bass, they are locked to the bottom. They'll be dunk, 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 all along just in a, in a real tight group. When they start getting up on top of each other in the signatures, I mean, this thing's looking down 21 feet. You start seeing big signatures like that. You know, you're talking seven, eight, nine, 10 pound fish. You know, is, do you believe that there's that many 10 pound bass down there on a the spot? No, that's probably not logical. So more than anything, what I've learned with the bass is when they're catchable and they're down there on the bottom, they're close together. They're in a row lined up on the bottom. They'll tick mark on the bottom. They'll be like 20 real close together, lined up in a, in a line along the bottom instead of stacked up on top of each other, kind of spread out all through the water column. Now, as the schools get bigger, and you start graphing over these places and, and schools of bass get on them that have hundreds of bass on them, yeah, they will stack up a little bit, but there'll still be a narrow band of them and they'll, be a, they'll still be aligned along the bottom and they'll be thick. The reason they stack up is because they literally all can't fit there together on the bottom. They're darting in and out and chasing shad, so they're, but they're still real close to the bottom in a band. You start seeing these little puffs or you'll see like fish stack look almost like they're on a ladder on top of each other. A lot of times that's white bass and crappie. That's how they like to orientate in the water. When I start seeing stuff like that, see how those are all that same level right down to the bottom. That's probably maybe three or four bass right there. That's more what they're gonna look like. When you're running current, those fish are gonna be real approximated to the bottom. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Well, and, and that's exactly right. That is exactly what you're looking for. Turn it off. All right. So that's exactly what you what you're looking for, and he's exactly right. You're looking for fish. It's almost the way I learned it is if you've got your graph set up right and you're looking at down imaging or side imaging. It's as if you took a felt tip pen and put little dots all along the bottom. And it looks like they're two foot off the bottom. And sometimes you can see fish and they start looking like stumps because they're just stuck so tight to the bottom. That's the way bass will line up. Like you said, especially if they're pulling current, uh, they will stick themselves to the bottom because they're trying to get out of that current and let the current bring things to them. So think of a felt tip pin just marking your graph and that's how big those fish will be. They're not gonna be enormous. Like you said, you, you, you really think 10, there's that many 10 pound fish that gang up together. Those are catfish, Asian carp, big drum. And that's not bad to see, right? You know drum if you're catching drum you're around you're around bass if you're catching a lot of white bass you're around the bass that you want to catch right but uh, the bass that you're trying to catch are going to be right along the bottom in a line and they'll just line up just like somebody took a felt tip pen on a white piece of paper and just dotted along the the bottom of the lake jason no, I think you said exactly right. And it, it, it's, again, I think a lot of us on here, um, are, you know, are learning or have learned parts of it. it what I, I will tell you this about ledge fishing is it's a, it's the closest parallel to golf that I've ever seen because you never thoroughly learn everything about it. You will get progressively better looking at them, understanding what you're seeing, understanding how they're positioned, and you'll get much better at it. And you'll actually be able to know if, hey, these fish, and the guy in the video said it right. If they're positioned and they're ready to bite, they you will as you do it over time, you'll know exactly what that looks like by spending time on your graph. But it is something that you never thoroughly learn everything about. You'll be consistently learning. But that is, Mike said it early in the conversation, this is when you'll catch some of the biggest bass of the year outside the spawn. But more importantly is this is when you can catch the numbers, the quantity, the pure quantity of fish you can go out and have, and I've had dozens and dozens and dozens of 50 to 75 fish days where you're catching 14 to 18 fish in a row on every single cast. Once you get them fired up and they're biting. Uh, and so it's worth the effort. It's not as much fishing, but it's a whole, once you get it out in, it's a whole lot more catching than it is if you're just going down, beating the bank. Yeah. 
Um, uh, another thing that I want to make sure everyone understands, you can find those felt tip marks looking at your graph and say so you've been graphing and this will happen to you. You'll graph for an hour and you'll say, oh my God, am I ever going to find what I'm looking for? And then you'll find it and you'll say, all right, here it comes. And you'll stop and you'll throw out and it will be crickets. You won't get a bite. Nothing will happen. And you'll say, well, I guess I didn't, I didn't see them. You're doing the right thing. Just because they don't bite doesn't mean they're not there. They're there. You saw them. They're just not in the mood to bite. Some, some people don't get, you know, they're not hungry all day. And the fish are the same way. So this is a timing thing. Some schools of fish will bite at 8 a.m. in the morning. Some schools of fish will bite at 1.30 in the afternoon. And you, you just got to keep working around and find out what that time is. Um, and, and this used to happen a lot on Bassmaster Elite Series when they went to Kentucky Lake. People would have these, these pro fishermen would have ledges that they had to be on at a certain time in the day. Otherwise, they didn't catch them. And they wouldn't worry about that ledge except for that certain period of time in that day. So just because you don't get bit doesn't mean they're not there. You just have to go on to the next ledge, go on to the next ledge and stay after it. They're there. You're doing the right thing. Um, let's see what this uh, question is, Jason. Yeah, Jonathan was asking uh, about cranks and plastics. Um, yeah, it's time to move on to that for sure. Yeah, I think it's a great sign. It's a perfect segue. We can kind of talk a little bit about um, – uh, we'll talk about lures. We'll talk about um, how I like to do it. Obviously, Michael interject. Uh, everybody fishes them a little bit different. But I'll kind of give you a couple of rules of thumb to work by. Uh, when they first get out, and that could be anywhere from the middle to the end of May to the first of June, somewhere in that time frame, you are much more likely to catch them on a more aggressive type bait. What I mean by that is a big crankbait, um, you know, if you're throwing a big uh, one or one and a quarter ounce uh, spinner bait, something that's very aggressive, you're more than likely, you're more likely to catch them when they first get out there with more aggressive baits. As the time goes on, as the season goes on, and those fish have seen 14,000 crankbaits in the last week alone, you're going to start, you'll start seeing other baits work better. I'm not saying you still can't catch them on a crankbait. But what I'm saying is when they first get out, the more aggressive baits later on in the season, um, as they've been conditioned, you start dropping down to, um, you know, more plastic type baits, more subtle baits. And then near the end of the season, uh, you may have to drop down even down to a drop shot or, or to a Ned rig, uh, something real small, something extremely slow. Uh, but that's what you're going to take to get bit. So uh, I want to preference kind of what the, the baits we're going to go through with that is the kind of the timing of the progression. The second piece of the timing, and uh, this question was brought up earlier, uh, is if it is, the, let me back up. I'm going to throw a crankbait from the beginning of the season to the end of the season, no matter what. I'm always going to at least give it a shot to get the more aggressive bait and the more aggressive fish that are out there on that specific spot. I may not throw it for an hour. I may only throw it for five or six casts. But I'm always going to put a crankbait through there. That's me personally. Let me let me add something before we before I forget and we move into showing the baits. If you pull up on that ledge and you see them down there and you start throwing, if you've not been bit in ten minutes, move on. This is a this is an instant gratification type of fishing. If you're not getting bit in ten minutes, they're not going to bite. So move on. Find find fish that are catchable, that are active. Um, and, and the way this works is, like Jason was saying, you pull up, you see them down there, you throw out, first, second, or third throw, you're going to have a fish. So that's the way this works. If you're yeah. not getting bit, move. Yeah, all that work that we talked about to find them, do all the graphing, everything to it, what makes it so wonderful, and, and you may think, why does everybody want to do ledge fishing? Why? It's, that's exactly what Mike said. You're going to go up there and you're going to get bit very soon. If you're not getting bit, you're going to go to somewhere else. And so you spent all this preparation time. And man, when it hits, uh, you'll, like I said, you'll catch fish after fish after fish. So I'm going to walk you through. I'm going to start with the crankbait. Uh, this is usually uh, what I start with. See it pretty good. This is a strike 
Strike King 6XD. Uh, it's the color that I like a lot. Um, this is actually the silent version. You can't really hear it because I got headphones on, but there's no knock. Uh, it's a silent version. And then there's another version that has uh, some BBs or little tungsten balls in there that when you shake it, it clack, 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 clack. Uh, I'll have both of them tied on and I will start with that. Uh, another great bait. Oh yeah, let me back up. We're going to go through the lures first and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about when and where. But uh, another great lure is the football head jig. And again, football head, because a lot of times you'll be throwing on rocks, shell bed, harder bottoms, not necessarily the silt bottoms. So a football jig, it's a fantastic bait. Uh, I use three quarter ounce, one of fishing ledges most of the time, unless the current's real bad, I may go down to a one ounce or sometimes I go to a half ounce if it's shallower. Uh, another great rig is your basic uh, Texas rig. We won't go through that. But everybody pretty much knows what a Texas rig is, uh, a bigger worm. Another bait that's come on the scene the last several years, you can see this, this is a shaky head. It's kind of a, it's got a flat bottom and it's just a magnum shaky head. This is actually three quarter ounce. It's got a, a five aught hook in it, really big hook. Uh, and so what a times I'll put uh, a bigger piece of plastic on there, 10, 12, 14 inch worm, something really big. Again, it's heavier, fish it uh, across the bottom. You just drag it. Uh, another great lure that I like to use, I call it the stupid head. Um, Mike's very familiar with this lure, but it's basically, it, it's a, it's a football head shape. So just like a football jig, but if you can see on the top, it's got a little screw lock right here and, and you can put, uh, I usually use like a six or eight inch worm. Uh, worm that I like to use a lot is the missile quiver and it screws into the screw lock and then this hook right point here buries into the plastic so it makes it wigless uh again it's another version of the magnum shaky head thing to keep in mind is um when you go down the aisle in academy or bass pro or wherever you're shopping and you see these baits that are enormous this is the time of year those are thrown and this is why they sell them for ledge fishing so a dt10 that five or six inch, maybe seven inch crankbait. That's what this is for. 12 inch uh, um, plastic worms. Ledge fishing is what that is for. Um, huge baits, huge. You got the big flutter spoon, show the big flutter spoon, Jason. I do, yeah. So uh, this is a normal spoon, uh, flutter spoon by Strike King. Uh, this is a five inch bait. It's the perfect time of year, it mimics a, uh, a shad really well. And then this is the Magnum Spoon. Um, <laughs> it looks like a dinner plate, I get or a hubcap, I get it. Just to put this in perspective, how big it is, I mean, this is my hand, so, um, I mean, it's massive, guys. It, it's absolutely massive. Uh, this is a three-aught hook. I mean, it's huge. Uh, and it weighs, uh, I think, two ounces, give or take, two, two and a quarter. Um, but it's by Castaic, a Ben Parker spoon. But what it does is you got these big gizzard shad. Gizzard shad are anywhere between eight to 12 inches long. Guys, they're huge fish. And these are the, this is what the, the bait that the bass are out there eating. And so this is a great bait uh, to mimic that. I'm not going to throw that in the dead of winter. I'm not going to throw that up shallow in the spawn, but deep ledges with big shad out there, the perfect bait. Uh, another bait that's really, really good, and we talked about it, is uh, the swim bait. This is the Money Minute swim bait. Uh, I believe this one is, I want to say six inches. Yeah, it's a six-inch bait. Uh, again, it, it looks like a shad. A six-inch bait, guys, looks real big to us, to a bass. It's not much at all. Uh, those, I like two, the, those two baits and the one he's about to show you, Super good baits when you see those fish ticked along the bottom and you see that they're two to three foot off the bottom. If they're sucked on the bottom, big football head jigs, big shaky heads, big crank baits that are digging down in the in the bottom of the lake. If they're stationary, suspended three, three feet, four feet off the bottom, two feet, the the underspin that he's showing you, that big uh, spoon that flutters up off the bottom and uh swim baits that's what those do that's what they're for yeah so this is actually uh an underspin it's just a souped up version this is actually the one ounce 
uh, and as, of course, as water gives it uh, resistance, this comes up here and just spins, give it some flash, and then I'll team that up, like I said, with the big money, min bug, money minnow uh, or another swim bait type, type head. Another one that uh, has really come on board is, uh, we got two of them. One, uh, this is a hog farmer bait, and it's actually, um, it's a wobble type bait, and it just gives it a, a it's like a swim bait, it just gives it a, a different shimmy, and uh, they are fantastic. Uh, get, get the heavier one, that's actually a one ounce. Uh, another one that's really, really good is, uh, we kind of hit on it, you can see it. I'll put it up here with my hat. You can see the red. Uh, it's a wobble head, uh, much like what we showed earlier with the football head, but it actually has a uh, it's a free swinging. So as this goes across the bottom and bounces around, this is just free swinging. Uh, gives it a different look. Uh, Carolina rig, guys. Uh, Mike is very modest, but Mike may be one of the best Carolina rig fishermen that I know. Uh, he has taken quite a bit of my money and my pride over the years uh, throwing the old ball and chain. It's not fun, it's not glamorous, uh, it's not sexy like some of these other baits, but uh, ledge fishing, guys, you just, it's really, really hard to beat a Carolina rig. So definitely uh, make sure that is in your arsenal. You talk about Center Hill, the Carolina rig, man, that is where it is at on those long points out into the main river. So Yeah, it's, those are fantastic. Some of the soft plastics, uh, so a lot of what I just showed you is, so I'll start with Craig Bates. Very aggressive. Uh, then I'll come back with a spoon. Uh, spoon's very aggressive. Again, when I say I'm throwing a spoon, I throw it out and I snap it. When I say I snap, I mean I snap it like I'm setting the hook. And that makes that spoon, as it flutters down, gets there, and it just jumps straight back up. And that is what triggers those fish. It's up in their face, and then it flutters back down. Uh, very aggressive working that. A jig. There's two ways you can fish a football head jig. When I, when I first start fishing a jig, I'm snapping a jig. Uh, or sometimes it's called stroking a jig. Uh, go out to YouTube, Google that. Uh, it's a great way to catch them. But uh, I'm doing the same thing with a football jig that I do with that spoon. I let it get on the bottom, and then I'm going to snap it straight up and real fast and real hard, and it's going to shoot straight off the bottom, just like I'm setting the hook. Uh, and, again, that's what's going to trigger them. Second way I fish a football head jig is just the old uh, just drag it along. Uh, and to Mike's point, when, they, when you look at the graph and they're stuck to the bottom, uh, I'm going to be dragging this thing just right in their face, just big, nasty, making them bite it uh, just to get them out of there. So we talk real aggressive. We're working through the process. The next thing that I'm going to do from a Gresham standpoint, depending on where the position is, what we talked about with the swim bait, uh, it's, very, it's much more natural. It is much more um, just – it's not as aggressive. So it's, it's more subtle. Uh, and then again, we're going to drop down to uh, shaky heads and edricks. Some of the soft plastics I like to use, I threw a couple of them up. Um, 10 inch upper worm by Strike King. Uh, again, let's talk colors, colors real quick. I keep it simple. I am not smart enough to go out there and, uh, and get real crazy with it. I keep it simple with your green pumpkins, your black and blues, uh, your June bug, which is kind of a purplish grape with a little bit of green in it. Um, depending on the time of year, I may have a little bit more blue or a little bit more red, a little bit more orange. Not overly necessary. A lot of times that just makes me feel better. But your green pumpkins, black and blues, June bugs, get those three colors. It'll cover 99.9% .9 of everything you want to do. So 10-inch stumper worm, great on your shaky head. It's great on your wobble head. Um, it's good. Uh, just overall Texas rig. We talked a little bit about um, – the missile, this is the quiver. It's a smaller worm, so it's good for uh, smaller shaky heads if you're fishing some shallower stuff. Uh, this is the other castaic bait. This is called the uh, Jerky J. I'll pull it back a little bit. Uh, you may not be able to see it very well on, uh, on the screen, but this is a six-inch bait. If you can see, it just has this straight tail. Not a lot of action. Uh, very... Uh, very easy to come through the water. It is not aggressive at all. It, it's, it's when those fish have seen a bunch of crankbaits and you're dropping down. Put this on that um, swim bait head with the little spin, the underspin. It's a really nice, subtle bait to use. So we talked a little bit. Uh, this is kind of the standard. Guys, it's been around the longest. This is what everybody uses uh, is the Zoom Old Monster. It's to use this all the way through the gamut of the stuff we talked about on the hook. Uh, 
Last thing that I will tell you about is uh, this is the D bomb by Missile Bates. I like to throw this on my Carolina rig. But more importantly, a little trick or a little tip that I'll drop with you. Uh, depending on the time of year, depending on what they're, that their bass are hitting on, uh, will depend on how much of this plastic I leave on my uh, football head jig. Normally, I kind of bite this in half and just have a little bit of the claws uh, sticking out here at the bottom. But what you can do is you can almost nose hook that and you will have your, uh, your soft plastic will hang out here. So what you've done is you've made that profile, you know, a good four to five inches. And so what you just beefed up your overall presentation and all you do is just change how much of the soft plastic hangs off the back of this football jig. So it's a great tip. If you want to try to catch, you're going for some bigger fish, again, bigger baits catch bigger fish. So, uh, make that bigger profile just by uh, by changing the placement of your soft plastic on that jig. And that's, again, I, we can take some more questions on that. Uh, feel free to put it in the chat or some question and answers. But again, big baits, big fish, more aggressive at the beginning, and then work your way down with less aggressive, more finesse. And all that does is it allows you to squeeze more fish out of that school because you're not going to catch every fish in the school. When you see 10, 15, 20 fish, uh, you may catch ha half of them. And on the video, uh, he was talking about there's schools of hundreds of bass. And you can go up there and you can catch 30 or 40 fish. You're not going to catch them all. But the way you keep them fired up, and what you'll hear the term fired up, the school fired up, all that means is they are aggressively looking. They saw their buddy just eat something, and they're like, hey, looking around, hey, what, what did you just eat? Where's food? And so they get into a feeding, it's called a feeding frenzy. It's much like you see. Uh, with offshore saltwater fish, think piranhas, how they're all coming in and trying to, uh, to eat whatever's there. Bass have the same type of mentality. Once you get that school fired up or once that school is aggressive and they're actively looking and they're chasing bait and they're trying to eat, uh, that is when you want to put as many lures as you possibly can in them. And once that you quit getting bit on the crankbait, go to the spoon. If you quit bit, bit on the spoon, go to the jig. Quit, get, quit getting bit on the jig, go to the swim bait. Just have that progression, and that way you can squeeze as many fish that are in that biting window as you possibly can out of school. And it's nothing, guys, to turn around. Uh, you may have nothing, and it could be five or six hours in the day and have no keeper fish that you're in a tournament and pull up to the right school and load the boat and have five five-pounders in 15 minutes. So it's very common, uh, but it's, it's all about the preparation. It's all about being prepared to handle that type of scenario. Well, this, this was a, a good video. I want to tell everyone that we, when we do these videos, we don't hold back secrets. Matter of fact, I, I gave you some of the ledges that I fished this past weekend in a tournament. So um, these, these, this is stuff that has taken, taken Jason and I really years to, to figure out. And I'm trying to, and Jason's trying to uh, lessen that, that learning curve on on learning about ledges and what fish look like on graphs uh, when you're looking at ledges. This is a this is a lot of stuff that it would take you a long time to figure out if you were trying to do it by yourself. And that's the whole point of these classes. We we want you guys to go out there and and not have to wonder if you're doing it right. If you do it like Jason and I said. That's how you do this. That's how everyone does it. Now, some of some people, like Ian Huey, guy out here on Old Hickory, friend of mine, he's he's really really good at it. One of the better people that I've I've ever seen, and he's going to, you know, you, it's going to take you a long time to reach that level. I'm not there. Jason's not there, but we can get it done, you know. And it just takes time, time on the water, time staying on your graph looking at your graph reading what's down there um, and you can do this too it's not it's not rocket science you've paid for these electronics figure out how to use them you know uh, zoom in on these electronics don't keep them out to 360 feet or 300 feet to the sides you got to get it 60 foot right 60 foot left because you want to see the little felt tip pin dot at the bottom if you're looking 150 feet to the right and left it's not even going to pick up that little bitty fish so 
even a five pounder, when you're looking at 150 feet of water, is not going to be big enough for your graph to pick up. So shrink that down to 60 foot left and right, maybe even a little less than that, and uh, get out there and use your graph and for what you spent your money on. That's a lot of money for these things, so you might as well use it, and now's the time to use it. Uh, we uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. Tell everybody about these um, about these classes. Um, we'll do them like we've been doing all uh, all spring and summer. We're going to do these each month. Next month, we're going grass fishing, um, the greatest time in the world on any lake. And uh, I can promise you, Jason is an expert when it comes to that stuff. Uh, but get out there. If you have questions, email me at my, uh, at my email address that I've given to each of you. Uh, you can email Jason at Jason Holland Fishing. Uh, or what is it? Jason at Jason Holland Fishing. Yep. Jason at Jason Holland Fishing um, is my email. Uh, or feel free to hit me up through Messenger on all the uh, Instagram, Facebook uh, type pieces as well. Uh, Mike, before we get too far, we got a couple questions that we want to hit on real quick. Uh, Jonathan asked, I see this is recording. Are they archived somewhere? I believe that uh, I'll let you answer that, but I believe they are. Yep, they're on our YouTube page, and we are revamping our um, website on the TWRA uh, website, the TN slash TWRA uh, website. TN.gov slash TWRA, I'm sorry. And so we're revamping that and, and we're showing everyone where they can fish and how they can fish. So when you click on how to fish, you can click on that uh, bass picture and it will bring up these videos. That will be on there shortly. It's not on there right now. If you want to see these videos that we've done, Jason and I, um, this year and some that I did with Ian Huey last year, they're on our YouTube page, uh, the TWRA YouTube page. So go out there and look at those. And you can also see these, uh, these videos. I'll give everyone that showed up tonight and we'll send that to you um, in your email. And the people that actually signed up for this event, I'll, I'll send to your email as well. But yeah, uh, you can look at all of our past shows on our YouTube page right now. And they're soon to be on the TWRA uh, state page. Oh, uh, I'll add a quick shameless plug for uh, Tennessee Wildcast, uh, which is a uh, the video podcast version of the TWRA. Uh, I'm on there typically once a month, give or take, and uh, do a podcast on fishing. It's another great information. The way I look at it is, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys spent the time uh, on a uh, sunny Monday night to hop on here, you guys obviously want to learn more, have a passion to learn more about bass fishing. Uh, we are just one resource. Um, you can't, there's so much information you can't digest it all. And so why we recommend, Hey, go back and look at something that we've done. Uh, spend some time, you know, Mike pulled up, uh, wired the fish. There's another great resource for you. Uh, YouTube is another great resource, but again, the more that you digest this, the more that you, uh, get into it. And ultimately, uh, it's your passion. Like everybody else on here, this is what I love to do. This is what Mike loves to do. We were doing it way before we were uh, in front of these cameras uh, because we love it and we're passionate about it. So uh, you've got two great resources. Um, you know, you, you, got, you now have your fishing guy. Uh, and uh, we had, um, I think it was Al, if I'm getting that right. Yes, uh, uh, Al was uh, new here. Uh, I'm assuming new to Tennessee. So, uh, you know, now, Al, you've got, uh, you've got two fishing guys you can go to if you've got questions. And so that's really what... The great thing about it is you're, you're building a network of resources, uh, not only what you can find publicly, but you'll have direct uh, direct access to myself or Mike. So, again, feel free to reach out, questions, anything that we can do to help. That's what we're here for. So I want to thank Mike for having me on uh, and for the TWRA for allowing me to come on and hopefully uh, give you guys some information as well. Always remember the three main things in life. That's your faith, your family, and, of course, fishing. Appreciate it. Feel free to hit me up. Anything that I can do to help you guys out, uh, guys and girls, uh, that's what I'm here for. So thanks again. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, get out, go fishing, have fun. Uh, tell everybody about these classes. We want to teach everyone 
Um, and uh, we're not pulling any punches. We're telling all of our secrets. So even on Kentucky Lake. So uh, tell everybody about them, and we hope to see you next month. And we're going to really show some good grass fishing. I'm getting excited about that. Nick and Jack in July, you can't beat it. My favorite. All right, guys. See Thanks, you everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>